So why well, don't you pray for that? So I start reading, then you can find your place. Okay, so yeah. Lord, we bless your holy name this morning, and uh, I thank you how just a beautiful day can inspire us, not just in our soul, but even in our spirit. Uh, Lord, when we come to appreciate the, certainly the beauty of your creation, but also the hope of uh, your purposes and sharing in uh the working out of that of those purposes lord and mm. sharing in the glory of them and uh lord even as the the sun shines mm. uh, everything in a sense does share in its glory mm. by being illumined by it and um energized by it mm. uh enlivened by it and lord we we uh, understand the the work and the presence of your spirit mm. to operate in a very similar way and uh lord nonetheless we know we yet live in a realm that is not uh eternally shining lord we have days and we also have Mm. nights and uh mm. but that doesn't discourage us mm. or we um we know how to remain in a place of uh of rest and uh stability and assurance in the nights uh of life mm. and in fact each night has its own uh, kind of beauty. Mm. Lord, for we, <laughs> I might not extend the metaphor too far, but mm -hmm. uh, Lord, the, the stars that, that shine mm. down upon us will remind us of the, mm. the many saints that have preceded us mm. and that look down upon your people mm. in this age in hope uh, and in expectation mm. and uh, <laughs> Lord we we never want to uh, take for granted the mm. the legacy mm. of your people mm. and the history of the working out of your great plan mm. for mankind mm. and so mm. indeed father whether we are in a, a sunny day like this or in the the depths of the night we know you are always mm. with us mm. and near us. And mm. so, Lord, we and do and indeed heed your uh, call to your people mm. to be not afraid mm. and to come unto you, mm. um, to follow you, Lord, and to, to look upon you and mm. uh, walk with you mm. that we may become like you. So, Lord, I do also bless uh, this time, mm. this morning, and uh, the rest of this day and its varied meanings. Mm. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man. Man. Well, thank you. Oh, well, that's a beautiful prayer. Bless the Lord. Well, in 53 of Isaiah 7 to 9, the book we are reading is authored by Alexander McLaren called the Exposition on Holy Scriptures. Uh, in, we are in the book of Isaiah, obviously. So um, the portion, you can do a search on that. He was oppressed, yet he humbled himself and opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slander, as a sheep that... Um, before her chariots is dumb, ye it open not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, that is for his generation who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. 
but the transgression of my people was his stricken, and they made his grave with uh, the wicked and with the rich in his death, although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In this session, the prophecy we pass from contemplating the sufferings inflicted on the servant to the attitude himself and of his uh, contemporaries towards this, his patience and their blindness. To this is the end of a remarkable reference to his burial, which strikes one in the first sight as interrupting the continuity of the prophecy, but on first consideration assumes great significance. One, the unresisting endurance of the servant. The revised version of the rendering of the first clause is preferable to that of the authorized version. Afflicted would be a little better than tautology, but a hum humbled himself strikes as a keynote of the words, which dwell not on the servant's afflictions, but on his bearing under them. Similarly, the pathetic imagery of the lamb led to the sheep dumb gives the same double representation, first of the indignities, and next of his demeanor in enduring them, as is conveyed in he was oppressed, yet he humbled himself. All remonstrating, all resisting endurance, then is the point emphasized in the lovely metaphor. We call the fact that he, this uh, emphatically, the duplicated phrase, open the knot, his mouth, was verbally fulfilled in our Lord's silence before each of the three authorities to whom it was presented before the Jewish rulers, before Pilate, and before Herod. It only when it adjured by the living God, and when silence would have been tantamount to withdrawal of his claims, did he speak before this Ahasian. Only when silence would have been taken as disowning his kingship, did he speak before Pilate, and the herald, who had no right to question him, received no answer at all. Jesus' lips were opened in witness, but never in complaint or remonstrance. No doubt the prophecy would have been as really fulfilled, though that had been no such majesty silences for its substance is a patient endurance, not mere abstinence from a speech. Still, as with other events in the life, the verbal correspondence with the prophetic details may help and to be meant to help to bring out more clearly for blind eyes the true fulfillment. So we may meditate on the wonder and the beauty of that picture which is the in one that is true and which the world has recognized with whatever differences as to its interpretation and the most perfect, pathetic, majestic picture of meek endurance that has ever been painted. But we gather only the most superficial of his lessons, if that is all we find to see about it. But the main point for us to lay to heart is not merely the fact that it's a silent submission, but the motive which led to it, or open not his mouth. But we willingly embrace the cross, and willingly embrace the cross because he loved the Father and would do his will, because he loved the world would be its a savior. That touchy imagery of the dumb lamb has manifold felicities and the significances beyond the serving to figure meekness. 
when are forcing unintended meanings into a mere piece of poetic imagination when we note how remarkably the metaphor links on to that of a street ship in the preceding verse, or when we venture to recall John Baptist's first proclamation of the Lamb of God and Peter's quotation of this word prophecy, and the continual recurrence in the apocalypse of the name of the Lamb and the title of honor of him who sits on the throne. A kind of uh, nimbus or your role, oh, how to lose that new word for me, I'm sorry, new or uh, real, or real, what that means even, so I think it's a shining light or glory, I'm not sure, let's see, look at it. It's a new one for me too. <laughs> yeah. Oriole. Oriole. A circle of light, brightness surrounding something. Okay. Oriole. Nimb nimbus. I don't know that word either. Let's just check it out. <laughs> Nim nimbus. You know that one? No? Yeah, the same yeah it's thing. like a cloud or something. Like yeah, halo, yeah. Again, okay. Mm. Luminous cloud or halo surrounding a superficial being or sense. Okay. A kind of nimbus. Or Orion shines around the humble figure and drawn by the prophet. Two, the misunderstood end of the servant's life. The difficult expressions of verse 8 are rendered in the revised version with clearness and so as to yield a profound meaning. We may note that here, for the first time, is spoken out that an end to which all the preceding description of suffering has been leading up, and yet is spoken with a kind of a Solomon with his, uh, what is the word? How does pronounce that word? Reticence? Re, re, reticence? Reticence? I'm sorry, reticence. Okay. Reticence. Reticence, okay. What well, that means here? Sorry. Learn a lot of words from this guy, reserve, okay, so. A Solomon reticence were impressive. The servant had taken away, cut off, shrieking. Not yet is the green word death plainly unturned so that it comes in the next words only after the servant's death is supposed to be passed. The three words assessed and all events so in half will language, violence and silence in the servants of fate. Who were the agents who took him? Cutting off and strike him is left in impressive obscurity. But the fact that his death was a judicial murder is set in clear light, whether we read by or from oppression and judgment, he was taken away. The forms of law are represented as arrested to bring about flagrant injustice. And if it were my subjects now to defend the messianic interpretation, we might ask where any fact can respond to this element in the picture are to be found in regard to either the national Israel or Israel within the nation. That unjust death by illegal violence under the mask of law was a further wholly misunderstood by his generation. We not do more than rem remark in the sentence of whole that a feature can respond with the fact in regard to Jesus asked whether it does so or any other theory for fulfillment Neither friends nor foes have ever have even the faintest conception of what the death of Jesus was always to effect. It is worthwhile to dwell for a moment on this because we're often told that there's no trace of the doctrine of a tuning sacrifice in the Gospels, and the inference is drawn that it was an afterthought of the apostles and therefore to be set aside as a, uh, as a Christians on Christianity according to Christ. 
The silence Jesus on that subject is exaggerated, but certainly not thought of his being the sacrifice for the sins of the world, was in the minds of the sand watchers by the cross, nor for many a day thereafter. It's not worth noting that precisely such a blindness to the meaning of the death had been prophesied eight hundred years before. But the reason why this feature is introduced seems mainly to be、uh, mainly to be to underscore the lesson that those who exercise the violence which hurried the servant from the land of the living were blind instruments of a higher power, and may we not also see in it a suggestion of the great solitude of sorrow in which the servant was to die? You and he, and the living in it, misapprehended and despised, he lived. Misapprehended, he he died. This was the loneliest man that ever breathed human breath. Ever breathed human breath. He gave up his breath in a more awful solitude. That ever isolated any other dying man, utterly solitary. He died that none of us need ever face death alone. Three. The servant's grave, falling on the mystery of the uncomprehended death, comes the enigma of the burial. The words are an enigma, but the same meaningless. Or any hypothesis, but the, the messianic one, as they stand, they assert that the unnamed persons give him a grave with the wicked, and they would do by putting him to death under strange forms of law, and that then somehow the criminal destined to be buried with other criminals in a dishonored grave was laid in a tomb with the rich. Excuse me. It seems a singularly minute treat to find a place in such a prophecy. The remarks already made as to similar minute correspondences in detail of the prophecy was a purely external fact in Christ's life. In order to be repeated now, one does not see that it's a self-evident axiom, needing only to be. Enunciated in order to be accepted, that such minute prophecies are beneath the dignity of a revelation. It might rather seem that as what、well, element in prophecy the eminently valuable, the smaller the detail, the more remarkable the provision, and the more striking the fulfillment. For the king sighted man, may forecast. Tendencies go far to anticipate events on the larger scale, but only God can foresee trifles. The difficulty in which this prediction of the servant's grave being with the rich places those who reject the messianic reference as a prophecy to our Lord may be measured by the desperate attempts to invade it by suggesting other readings or by making rich to be. Synonymous with the wicked, the words at the stand have a clear and worthy meaning. On one interpretation, I will even venture to say, on one interpretation only, namely, as they refer to the relevant laying the body of the Lord in the new tomb belonging to a certain rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph. If in the land clause of verse nine we render because rather than all as though, we get the thought that the bearer was a sign that a servant to slay as a criminal, it was not a criminal. The criminals were either left unburied or disgraced by promiscuous interment in an unclean place, but then bowed reverently. Bedewed with tears, 
wrapped in fine linen, clean and white, softly laid down by loving hands, watched by love stronger than death, lay in fitting repose at the corpse of a king, till he came forth as a conqueror. So once more the dominant note is struck, and this part of the prophecy closes with the emphatic repetition of the sinlessness of the suffering servant, which makes his suffering a deep and bewildering mystery, unless they were endured because our transgression. Can I read on?、Um, I wanted to read this portion. It's a little bit. So is that okay? So, okay.、Mm-hmm. We are in the next session called the Suffering Servant, the fourth part. It's Isaiah fifty-three ten. It pleases the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soil an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pledge of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We have seen distinct progress of the thought in the preceding verses. There was first the outline of the sorrows and rejection for the servant. Second, the profound explanation of this as being for last. Third, the suffering, death, the burial of the servant. We、we'll、follow him to the grave. What more can there to be said? Whether the servant of the Lord be an individual, on the collective, or an ideal, surely all fitness of a metaphor, all reality fact, will require that its work should be represented as an ending with his life, and that what mind follow his burial should be the inference of his memory. The continued operation of the principles he had set ago,、um, a going and a swam, but nothing more. Now observe that, or we may explain the fact that is a fact to be explained. That is, there is a whole session, this closing one, devoted to the celebration of the work of his death, the burial. Is still more remarkable that the prophet says nothing about his activity on the world till after death. In all the former portion, there is not a syllable about the doing something, doing anything, only about his suffering. And then, when he is dead, he begins to work. That is subject to these last three verses that it would be proper to take them all for. Our consideration now, but for two reasons: one, because the great fullness and importance, and one because, as you will observe, the two latter verses are under direct address of God concerning the servant. The prophetic words spoken as in his own person end with the verse ten and catching up. The representations, expanding, defining, glorifying them, comes to Solomon's sonda of the voice gods. Are now deal with only, are、uh, deal only with the prophet's vision of the work of the servant of the Lord. On one preliminary remark, is then the work of the servant of the death it described in these verses was constant to the word emphatic reference. To his previous sufferings, the closeness connection between these two is also so into great prominence. One, the mystery of God's treatment of the sinless servant. The first clause to be read in immediate connection with the preceding words: the servant was for absolute sinlessness, yet the divine hand crushed and bruised him. Certainly, if we think the With hymns of prophetic rebukes and of the standing doctrines of the Old Testament of, that Israel was punished for its sin, we shall be slow to believe. Now this picture is the sinless one, smitten for the sin of others, can have reference to the nation, any of his parts, or to any one man. 
However, other poetry may lament over innocent sufferers. The Old Testament always takes the ground. Our iniquities, like the wind, have carried us away. But mark then here, whoever understood, the prophet paints a figure and so sinless that God's brings him is an outstanding wonder and riddle only to be solved by regarding these bruises and the stripes by which our sins were healed, uh, by noting that the pleasures of the Lord be carried on through him after and through his death. What a considerable application have such representation set to Jesus. We know then here, one, the Solomon truth, that his sufferings were divinely inflicted. That is a truth complementary to the other views in the prophecy according to which the sufferings are wisely regarded as a, either inflicted by men, by oppression, judgment, he was taken away, or draw on him by his own sacrificial act, his soul shall make offering for sin. It was the divine counsel that used men that his instruments, though they were nonetheless guilty, the hands that crucified the slew were no less the hands of a lawless man, because it was the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that delivered him up. But a still deeper thought that is in these words, for we can scarcely avoid saying in them a glimpse into the dim region of eclipse and agony of soul from which, as from a cave of darkness, into that last cry, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachethani. The bruise is inflicted by the God who made to meet on him the iniquity of us all were infinitely more severe than the wheels of the soldiers of rod, or the wounds of the nail that pierce his hands and the feet. To the staggering mystery of his sinlessness and suffering, the wound has been full for an old story for goodness tortured and evil exalted, which have drawn tears, softened hearts, but which have a hollow subordinate man who would fain believe in a righteous governor, a loving father. But none of these have cast so blank a shadow for suspicion on the garment of the world by a good God that does the feet of Jesus, unless it read in the light of this prophecy, standing at the cross. Faith in God's goodness and providence can scarcely survive unless it rises to be faith in the tuning sacrifice of him who was wounded there for our transgressions too. The servant's work in the sufferings. The margin's revised version gives the best rendering. His soul shall make an offering for sin. Excuse me, turn this off. Excuse me. The word employed for offering means a trespass offering and carry us and one and once back to the sacrificial system. The trespass offering was distinguished from other offerings. The central idea of it seems to have been to represent sin or guilt as debt and the sacrifice of making composition. We must keep in view the variety of ideas embodied in the sacrifice, in his sacrifice, and how all correspond to realities in narrow wants and the spiritual experience. Now, there are three points here. A, the representation that Christ's death is a sacrifice clearly connecting with the whole mosaic system that in the sense of a transplant offering, Christ seemed to quote this verse in John 
10 15 when he speaks of laying down his life or when he declares that he comes to give his life on a ransom for many at any rate here is the great word sacrifice proclaiming for the first time in connection with the messiah here is the prophet in the praise the meeting of all the types and shadows of the law that is sacrificial that sacrificial system bore witness to deep wounds of a man's soul and prophesied of one in whom this were all met and satisfied b is a voluntary surrender he is a sacrifice but he is a priest also his soul makes the offering and his soul is an offering and offered himself itself in concurrence with the divine will it is difficult and necessary to keep the double aspect in view and never to think of jesus as an unwilling victim not of god as angry and needing to be appeased by blood b the thought that the true meaning of his sufferings is only reached when we contemplate the effects that have flowed from them the pledge of the lord in bruising him is a mystery until we see how pleasure of the lord prospers in the hand of the crucified three the work of the servant of the death surely this is a paradox so boldly stated it meant to be an enigma stato, to stato and to rose curiosity. This is the servant, the seal of the trivial of the trivial, trivial of his soul, and to prolong his days. All the interpretations of this chapter, which refuse to see this in the sewers on this rock, what a contrast there is between plentitudes about the spirit of the nation rising transformed from its grief for captivity which was only where possibly the case and the historical fulfillment in Jesus Christ here at any rate hundreds of years before his resurrection is a word that seemed to point to such a fact and to me it appears that all fair interpretation is on the side of the messianic reference Note the singularity of a special point. A. Having died, the son sees his offering. The sacrifice of Christ is a great power which draws man to him and moves to repentance, faith, love. His death was a communication of a life. Nowhere else in the world's history is a teacher's death the beginning of his gathering of pupils. Not only has the death servant the chosen, but he sees them. That representation is expressive of the mutual intercourse, strange and deep, whereby we feel that he is truly with us, Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, we love. B. Having died, the servant prolongs his days. He lives a continuous life without end forever. The best commentary is the word which John heard as he felt the hand of the Christ, of Christ, the Christ laid upon his prostrate form. I became dead. Lo, I am alive forevermore. C. Having died, the servant carries into effect the divine purposes. Prosper implies progressive advancement. Christ's sacrifice carried out the divine pleasure. By his sacrifice, the divine pleasure is the first or carried out. If Christ is a means of carrying out the divine purpose, consider what this implies for divinity in the nature. A risk of a correspondence between his will and the divine. But Jesus not only carries into effect the divine purpose as a consequence of a past act, but by his present energy. 
this dead man is a, a living power in the world today. Is he not? The Solomon, the, the sole explanation of the vitality of Christianity, and the sole reason which makes the message a gospel to any soul, is Christ's death for the world, and present life in the world. Let me continue. I want to read the suffering sermon as a whole. I'm sorry, so let me do that. Okay, so Isaiah. Fifty-three, eleven. He shall see of the trivial of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, and it shall bear their iniquities. It's all but the closing words. This great prophecy that is the fitting crown of all that has gone before. When being listened into the voices of the member of the race to whom the servant of the Lord belonged, whether we limited that to the Jewish people, including it all humanity, that a voice has been confessing for the speaker and his brethren their common misapprehensions of the servant, the blindness to the meaning of the sufferings and the mystery of his death. They have been proclaiming the true significance of this, as now he had learned them, and as in verse ten, that's the mystery of the reward and triumph for the servant. Then, notice glory and coronation is caught up in the two closing verses, which in substance are the continuation of the idea of verse ten, verse ten. But this identity of substance makes the variety of form the more emphatic. Of there's a my servant of verse eleven, though I will divide of verse twelve. This obliges us to make this as a voice of God. The confession and belief of earth is hushed, and the recognition and the reward of servant may be declared from heaven. And the solemnity is thus given to the words, and the prophecy comes around again to the keynote on which it sta- started in chapter. Ah,、uh, fifty-two, thirteen. My servant. Notice too, or the same chat, or the same characteristic is here, as in verse ten, that it, the recapitulation of the suffering is almost equally prominent with the description of the reward. The two are so woven together that no power can part them. We may take these two verses and setting forth many two things: a divine promise. That the servant shall give it righteous to many, and the divine promise that the servant shall conquer many for himself. But the exposition of here is properly kanjo, not、uh, partitity, as the authorized version has it. Chuvio is not to be understood in the sense of a childbirth, but of a toil and、uh, suffering. Soul is equivalent to life. The food of his soul's trivial is a force defined in the words which follow. The great result which will be beheld by him and will fill and content his heart is that by his knowledge he shall justify many. By his knowledge, so that it means by the knowledge of him on the part of others. The phrase might be taken either objectively or subjectively, but it seems to me. And only the former yields an adequate sense. My righteous servant is scarcely emphatic enough. The words in the original stand in an unusual order, which might be represented by the righteous one, my servant, and is intended to put emphasis on the servant's righteousness as well to suggest the connection between his righteousness and his justifying in virtue of his being righteous. Justify. Is an unusual form, meaning to procure for or impart righteousness to. The meaning is stressed on the article and is a, a tithesis none to all, but to few. My rendered is a, the manses, an indefinite expression which, if not declaring universality, approaches very near to it, as in Romans verse、uh, five nineteen and Matthew. Um, what is that? Twenty six, twenty eight. 
he shall bear a uh, feature referring to the servant in a state of uh, exhortation and point to his continuous work after death. This bearing is the root of uh, our righteousness. Let me put the thoughts here in define, definite order. One, the great work which the servant carries on. It consists in giving or imparting righteousness. It seems to me that it's out of place to be too narrow here in interpreting so as to draw distinction between righteous imparted a righteous bestowed, we should rather take the general idea of making righteous and making in fact, in fact, like himself. Note that this is a work which in Christ's characteristic one. Note that this is the work which is Christ's characteristic one. All thoughts is a bit of his blessing to the world, which all made that are imperfect too. The preparation for them making our, of us righteous. The roots of our being made righteous by the righteous servant are found in the bearing our sins. It's the same bearing work is the basis of our righteousness. Christ justified a man by giving to them his own righteousness and taking in turn their sins on himself that he, he may expiate them. Not only did he bear our sins in his own body on the tree, but he will bear them in his exhortation to the throne. And only because he continuously and externally, internally does the soul, are we justified on earth, and shall we be sanctified in heaven? 3. The condition on which he imparts righteousness. His knowledge, which is to be taken in the profound biblical sense as including not only understanding, but experience also. Parallels are found in this is a life internal to know they. John, um, what is that? That is, uh, what? I'm sorry. What is that? 13? 17. Oh, 17, sorry. 17, 3. And in that I may know him, Philip. Philippians 3.10 So this prophecy comes very near to the New Testament, the proclamation of righteousness by faith. 4. The grand sweep for the servant's work. The meaning is indefinite. It is where indefiniteness approximates it to universality, a shadowy vision of a great multitude that no man can number stretch it out as to the horizon before the prophet. How many there are that uh, they are, he knows not. He knows that they are numerous enough to satisfy the servants for all his sufferings. He knows that too, there is no limit to the happy crowd, except that which is said by the necessary condition of joining the bands of the justified, namely the knowledge of him, they who receive the benefits which the servant has died or will live to bring, cannot be few. They may be all, if any, are shut out, they are self-excluded. 5. The servant's satisfaction. Be that the word employed means for rather than content, but the land idea can scarcely be altogether absent from it. We have then the greed hope, that the servant gazing on the result of suffering will be content, content to have to, had borne them, content with what they have effected. The glory dies not, and the grief is past. And the grief had it for fruit not only glory gathering around the throne, the thorn pierced the head, but with that glory shining on the brows of the many whom he has justified and sanctified by their experience of him and his power. The creator work ends, ended with the rest of the creator, not because his energy was tired and needed to repose, but because he had fully carried out his purpose and saw the prophetic idea embodied in a creation that was a very good redemptive work 
ends with a certain satisfying contemplation of the many whom he had made like himself. He is a better creation with that rampart. Bless the Lord. What a still the continue with the suffering sermon. I like it. Beautiful, beautiful. Hmm. Go ahead, Noah. Why don't you wrap up for us here? Mm -hmm. Lord, may we never forget the reason we have been able to enter into a new life and the means by which we are living and being made into new creations. Lord, when we consider your life as a pattern, we must certainly not neglect the reality of the crucifixion mm. and the sufferings that you underwent. Lord, for that is the uh, really the, the center and emphasis of what we are to um, emulate father in uh, what you did as a man um, on this earth mm. and lord we have a an enlightened way of under understanding this what in it not being uh, denying ourselves in pursuit of our own righteousness or of what uh, we understand to be uh, holiness and ascetic living father rather that it is something uh, that in a sense we do not choose Lord we don't choose our own crosses mm. it's something that you bestow upon us as mm sons that are being raised in true righteousness mm. and uh, well this is truly following after the pattern of your son mm. and Lord when we seek to teach your ways mm. whether it be in word or in deed mm. may we never forget uh, your son as as Paul puts it, as Christ and him crucified. Mm. Uh, Lord, for that is the, the basis and the foundation mm. of, uh, of all that you have made accessible to man to, to be made clean and mm. uh, holy and worthy mm. before you. Mm. Lord, you restored that way once mm. more. Mm to do to mankind mm. and Lord I'm even reminded of Andy's vision last night mm. which is an interesting picture of a, a, a foolish kind of Christianity mm. which would uh, assume some kind of faulty foolhardy freedom Mm. not realizing uh, how it got to that place mm. in the first place and uh, mm. being unaware of the the order and uh, unflinching nature of its uh, surroundings mm. which proves to be its own demise mm. for in his vision that young lady falls off the wall mm. and the most idol, fleeting you know? moments yeah the yes that's what I was about to say the <laughs> yeah. fleeting moments mm. before her 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 death it that's, was that's unfortunately many, the, her true nature yeah many yeah. Christians idea what the freedom in the Lord means you know basically exactly called be yourself 
to others and mm -hmm. be a holy one, be set free in Christ. And that's the uh, idea of mentioning about somebody <coughs> and try to name me uncle, be say older or whatever. Now he's the right to, to acting as he, we, he is, you know, so <laughs> rather than say, <laughs> can you help him to grow, mature, you know, so to be transformed. So, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's really the orphan mind for thinking relationships, preconditioned mm. already. The one third kind of relationship or their ideas, what others should be for them. So you can't find this self-centered way thinking like that you know so don't call it against god's way so yeah go ahead that's kind of a sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> short aside yeah, christianity we have out there sorry <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah go ahead mm -hmm. the capstone becomes the stumbling block that mm. shatters that kind of christianity mm. that's a good way to put it mm. and lord rather than uh, presuming that kind of freedom that is really a manifestation of self-centered and worldly living. Mm -hmm. We want to be uh, not those who Hello? Okay. 